Welcome to Name Takes, a podcast about the cultures of naming. From the names of streets to buildings to people and beyond. What are the stories behind certain names? And what causes do specific names promote? Where can the roots of one name or other be found? Could these be invented? In Name Takes, we include artists' voices and cases from the art field. Because in art, meaning making is central. And most of all, because art helps us formulate better questions about the present. In this episode, we'll talk about name changing and about the motivations and contexts for naming. Hi, I'm your host KM, again, joining you from Rotterdam. As mentioned in episode one, Kunst Institute Melly was previously called Witte de Wit. What we haven't told you is that our original name was in fact different. When our institution was conceived in the mid-1980s, the art center was actually called Kunsthuis, which translates as Art House. But only a few months short of our public opening in January 1990, the name was changed to Witte de Witt Center for Contemporary Art. So what was first seen as a house for art in a more generic way now turned into a center tied to a specific street and deliberately focused on contemporary art production. Our name anchored us in our Rotterdam neighborhood. And yet, we were still given an international name, spelled out in English, as opposed to the original Dutch Kunsthuis. What may seem like a minor change from a distance does have significant effects. An institution's name not only shapes public perception, it also informs its inner working culture. Imagine for a moment that you worked in a Kunsthuis. Now imagine working in a center for contemporary art. How would you speak about it? Where would you fit in? Or perhaps there's simply not a good fit yet. Name changes are not about finding the perfect name. Because let's be honest, can there be a single right name? What name changes can do is show us that naming is an ongoing process a process of finding a better name. Our founders were not the only ones to work with an existing name and then add Center for Contemporary Art to it. Many art organizations have done something similar. Rather than searching for a new name, they adopted an existing name, one that pointed to their location or that was site-specific. For instance, take PS1, Center for Contemporary Art, founded in 1976. It is located in the former public school number one of New York City's Queensboro they decided to preserve the acronym PS1 as part of their institutional name. Closer to us, the Wheel Center for Contemporary Art in Brussels is located in a former brewery and is named after the beer that used to be made on site. Another example is La Tabacalera Centro Internacional de Arte Contemporáneo in the Basque Country, which opened in 2015 in the derelict Donastia Tobacco factory. Further away, there's the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery in Toronto, which was actually renamed from the Art Gallery at Harbour Front. In Mexico City. Usina do Gasometro in Porto Alegre. The Mattress Factory in Philadelphia. Fleece Hall in Middelburg. These examples show a trend in appropriating an existing legacy. They also reveal that a name doesn't come out of nowhere, that what comes before matters. And 
even more importantly, that context matters. And this is my segue into our own name-changing process, from Witte de Wit to Kunstinstitut Mali. There was an urban agenda behind the name Witte de Witt Center for Contemporary Art. It was about boosting the arts and culture in Rotterdam's city center. It was about making Witte de Witt a cultural axis in the last decades of the 20th century. But now, we are part of a different context. Let's put this in numbers. According to the Migration Policy Institute, more than 40% of Rotterdamers are foreign-born or have at least one foreign-born parent. Over 40%, that's almost half of the city's population. The World Population Review of 2020 indicates that most of the foreign-born Rotterdamers come from Suriname, and residents of Turkish, Moroccan, and Dutch Caribbean descent also significantly contribute to the city's super-diverse population. In the previous episode of this podcast, we looked at Witte Cornelis and de Witt. We explained how he was instrumental in the VOC Maritime Company, which thrived in the 17th and 18th century because of the labor and trading of enslaved people. We also spoke about how the 17th century became known as the Dutch Golden Age, and how that period was a crucial reference for street naming throughout the country during the 19th century. But the Rotterdam of today has a multivocal heritage, one that calls for acknowledging and dismantling intrinsic colonial structures. Names, naming, and renaming are an essential part of this work. In the summer of 2017, our process of name searching began. This is when an open letter to Witte de Witt sparked a cultural debate in the Netherlands. The letter was authored by Egbert Alejandro Martina, Ramona Snow, Hodan Warsam, Patricia Schor, Amal Al Haag, and Maria Guggenbichler, and it was co signed by many more people. Their letter condemned Witte de Witt for not critically regarding the colonial references of its name, even while working on an art project about decolonizing. The artwork that sparked this debate was Cinema Hollanda Platform, by artist Wendelin van Oldenburg and curator Lucy Cother, a project staged at our institution by our former director Daphne Ayas and former curator Natasha Hoare. The open letter also called attention to the implicit inequality in the arts and the need to dismantle its long-standing value system. This open letter and art project amplified an existing debate on decolonization in the Netherlands. Moet Witte de Wit van naam veranderen? Should Witte de Wit change its name? This became a hot question on social media platforms, in newspaper editorials, in public forums, and in informal café conversations. And then, in September 2017, our institution published a press release announcing it would change its name. Casueda, who at the time was the chairman of our board, stated the reason for this in a press release. The reference in our name to Witte Cornelison de Witt and its connotations are in conflict with the values we stand for as an institute for contemporary art and culture. By January 2018, the institution vowed that the name change would also involve 
a process of institutional transformation. In other words, it was not going to be a quick rebrand. From then onward, our team and board were intentionally diversified. Our ground floor art gallery was transformed into a multi-purpose space devoted to public engagement. Soon after, that space was named Melly by the group of participants in one of our art education programs. The group was inspired by a public artwork by Canadian artist Ken Loom titled Melly Shum Hates Her Job. This artwork was commissioned in 1990, the very first year we opened our doors to the public, and it has been displayed on our facade as a billboard ever since. The billboard features a portrait of a smiling young woman of Asian descent. In this image, she poses as a clerical office worker. Next to her portrait is a text in big, bold letters that says, Melly Shum hates her job. The participants of our education program connected with the message and portrait of this woman named Melly Shum. They understood the immigration experience embedded in the billboard, that people immigrate to seek a better life for themselves and their families, even at the cost of a dreary job. Melly had been on our exterior brick wall for so long. She stood for our institution's own history. And more, Melly Shum also echoed the history of immigration in Rotterdam, where nearly half of the population has a migrant background. When the time came for selecting a new name for the Witte de Witt Center for Contemporary Art as a whole, Melly embodied our ongoing institutional transformation. It is a name that could promote the institution's interest in public engagement and that could draw connections between art, people, and context. And this is how, in January 2021, our new name became Kunstinstitut Meli, which in English means Meli Art Institute. Our name change takes place in a cultural field that is defined by power structures and conflicts. A case in point of this ongoing dynamic is the Witte de Witstadt in Eindhoven. In 2018, its name was changed to Barbarostrad, referencing a Turkish seafarer. The selection was made through a participatory process, and the outcome suggests that many inhabitants in the neighborhood in question are, in fact, of Turkish descent. To no surprise, this decision was not unanimous. Shortly after the announcement, a local political party submitted a public motion to preserve the name Witte de Witstadt. The motion was overturned. Names reckon with matters of representation. When you ask yourself, can I see myself in that name? They also reckon with matters of recognition. When you wonder, is the current and original context recognized in this name? Earlier, I described Name changes as processes of finding a better name, not necessarily of finding the right name. While making this podcast, we've been working with artist Sasha Huber to present an exhibition at our galleries. We've actually co-organized this exhibition with the power plant. Yes, the same power plant turned art space in Toronto about which I spoke earlier. Sasha is of Swiss-Haitian heritage. Her work mostly centers on colonial and racist traces and questions of collective memory 
and identity. In 2007, she became involved in the international and transdisciplinary demounting Luis Agassiz campaign. This campaign was initiated by Hans Fessler, a Swiss historian and activist, who in 2005 published an in-depth study on Switzerland's involvement in slavery and the slave trade. We met up with Sasha to talk a bit more about the demounting campaign. She tells us that... There are about 80 places named after him, um, in, especially in North America, and, and um, there are lakes named after him, mountains. In Switzerland, for instance, there is a mountain called Agassiz Horn, uh, which he named actually himself with his colleagues uh, at the time when he was not even so known yet. Um, so each place has a different story of how, he, how those places were named after him. For instance, he was in Brazil in 1865 to lead an expedition for one year, and after that year, there were a few places named after him, like a, a, a cave, for instance. But then it didn't stop there. There are seven species as well that are named after him. Um, and then also on the moon, there is a promotorium, which means an elevation. And on Mars, there is a crater. Agassiz's name was given to these natural sites during his lifetime, between 1807 and 1873 but also much more recently. Why him? Louis Agassiz, he was a Swiss-born uh, glaciologist uh, at first. He's, he's, uh, he's from Neuchâtel, from the French-speaking part of Switzerland, and he was the son of a priest, actually, originally. So he, he grew up religious. And um, so he became established as a glaciologist and, and naturalist, also becoming specialized in fossil studies and um, etiology. That means uh, he researched also fish. And this is also a reason why there are many places around the world named after him, like natural sites. So why is there a demounting campaign? Sasha explains that in 1846, when Agassiz moved to the U.S., he became an active proponent of what we now call scientific racism. He claimed that the white race was superior, he supported racial segregation, and he was against miscegenation, which is interracial marriage and reproduction. As a default Christian, Agassiz even suggested that black people did not come from the same white Adam and Eve from which he himself descended. In 1850, Agassiz commissioned daguerreotypes to be made of enslaved people on the Atch Hill Plantation in South Carolina. These early photographs were some of the first portraits of African enslaved people and were made to scientifically prove their biological inferiority. One of the enslaved photographs was Renty Taylor, who was stolen from the Congo Basin and brought to the U.S. By the way, Renty's birth name is unknown. Taylor is the last name of his enslaver. As a member of the Demounting Agassiz campaign, Sasha says that... I felt compelled uh, to do something, not just writing letters. She's talking about the Agassiz Horn Mountain in Switzerland. Its peak is almost 4,000 meters. I would like to go to the mountain and, you know, rename it with a sign, with a name, and it, in a way, in a symbolic way, but in a physical <laughs> way. The images that uh, came out of it ha had a very powerful effect, in a way. Sasha's sign said Renty Horn, the mountain of Renty. Yes, the same Renty in Agassiz's photographs. 
Sasha's motivation goes beyond the man in the photo. The new name, she says, is... Because it is basically in the honor of, of Renty, but of all people who experienced similar fates, who, who were forced into this enslaved life. Sasha and other, the committee's actions they, they did other things have had ripple that. effects to the point that Renty's descendants recently filed a lawsuit to gain reparation and to recuperate the images and copyright of Agassiz's photographs, which are in a collection of the acclaimed Peabody Museum at Harvard University. The case was dismissed in March 2021. After this conversation and other similar ones, I started asking myself, does every place need a name? Why do we want to name everything around us? For many artists who are involved in promoting social and political change, working with representation is not just a matter of acknowledging and picturing the unseen. It's not just about image making or making beautiful objects, nor is it about being inventive and original. For them, making art also involves community work and cultural advocacy, as well as historical learning and education. These kinds of artists, like Sasha Huber, are interested in the meaning of signs and symbols that exist or that they can create. They are also focused on raising awareness of the effects that those signs and symbols have on culture. To explore this position further, we engage the artists Irene Anastas and Rene Gabri. Irene and Rene have been organizing activities at 16 Beaver, a space for art, thought, and politics, which they founded in 1999 together with other artists. The name, 16 Beaver, has actually been its address in downtown New York, near Wall Street. But we didn't ask Irene and Renee to speak about this. Instead, we asked them for their thoughts on naming places more generally. A place has changed, has vanished, has stayed, has remained renamed. A name is, among other things, a designation, a marking a way of situating things. A name is somehow always conjoined to a place. Every name is a kind of place name. Palestine is one such name, with all its questions and problems the same. What is maybe less thought about is that every name is also tied to a time. It maintains, contains, retains, detains, a certain relation to time. Some names recover time, others fix time, erase time, reclaim, declaim, exclaim a time. When you say a name, a sound may be uttered, then heard. A thought is called, an idea, a place, a person, a town, a city, a village. But are they, are they there? Where really, where is there? There are times without name, and some names search for a time, and some names search for a place and a time. Now, not now, now, not now. The name now, where is it, where? The now that vanished, finished, perished yesterday, and the now that is not yet, not yet there. The place from which this writing I writes is called by a number. It is the number 15, it is the number 48, it is the number 67. 
What is it to live inside, inhabit a number? Our problem is that the now, its presence, has been as if dictating a lack. Already is gone or not yet there. Already passed or not yet, not yet there. To name a place a number, not the number as place of address, but the number as a place time. I am from 48. What is this act of naming which names the time, the year, that an old was forcibly replaced by a new name? What is it to refuse this imposition? What is this place named by a time? I can never return to 15. I grew up in 48. What is it to inhabit this place named by a number marking a time? A body is a name of a body in the forest on time. A lion, a snake, a tree, or even the body of earth. We have resolved to name this place by a number, recalling a time not to remain in the past, but to see the past that remains, remaining, renaming through the rupture. How to name that place time? The lion does not care about its name. It roars the same. The snake in Palestine, in the south, in the desert, in the Nakab will bite you the same. It has done so before to anyone coming its way, anyone intending to harm, to kill, to displace, to deny, to deny it anything that gives it its form, its way of life in the desert, the fertile desert of Palestine. What is that name that places me in a time which remains, in which we suspended not in a linearity of a time paused, but in the prolongation of an instant into a life, a lifetime experienced as a duration and an enduring, refusing that demarcation of a before and an after. But what is this time naming or this naming of time, of a place as time? Who said, who said that this desert, this that aforementioned desert of Naqab is not full of life to name? A life, al wal no matter what, nomadic the same. A life, al-ghazal, al-jabal al-Filistini, if you name to tame, escapes you the same, al-mahal arabi. A life, a dhib in its form, inseparable from its ways, al-wawi, its modes, al-thalab al-ahmar, its thinking, al-ihsani, its sensing, al-ayl al-asmar al-farisi, and feeling the way. A refusing a form of living as forgetting, affirming a way of living as awaiting, returning. Irene was born in Bethlehem and Renee in Tehran and is of Armenian descent. When we reached out to them to participate in this podcast, they were preparing for a conference about what solidarity could mean for Palestine, or with and through Palestine. This was in May, during the peak of the Israeli bombings of Gaza and their efforts to expel Palestinian residents of East Jerusalem. Nearly 300 people were killed, mostly Palestinians, many children, in some cases, entire families. Who are the victims? What are their names? Why does this kind of knowing matter to some of us? We will come back to these questions in the coming episodes. And that's where we'll leave it for now. Join us for our next episode of Name Takes, a podcast about the culture of naming. For now, thank you for listening. Yours, KM. Name Takes is produced by Kunstinstitut Meli in Rotterdam. 
thanks to a grant from a donor who wishes to remain unnamed. Research and writing for this podcast by Sara de Meuse and Sofia Hernandez Chonkoy. Special thanks to Rosa de Graaf and Sasha Huber for participating in this episode, as well as to Irene Anastas and Rene Gabri for their original contribution. Our gratitude goes to Akena Wilson for performing KM and to Judith Schulz for performing select citations. Voice recording, mixing and original music created by Jan Poel at Okapi Recordings in Rotterdam. Mastered by Master Enzo Mastering. Production management was overseen by Wendy van Slagmaat Bos and communication and marketing by Jeroen Laven. Kunstinstituut Melli is supported by the Ministry of Education and Culture in the Netherlands and the city of Rotterdam. Additional funding is procured through admission tickets, sales of publications, foundation grants and individual donations. For more information, please visit kunstinstitutmelly.nl. Thank you.